in the next couple of minutes. Um, hi everyone, I'm Annalisa and some of you may know me as Anna and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for ASGSR, um, which is American Society for Gravita Gravitational and Space Research uh, student chapter. Um, here we have today is uh, Dr. Christopher Viney, who was my undergraduate advisor and he's now my mentor still and my great friend. Um, and he was my advisor when I was a material science and engineering undergraduate at University of California Merced, UC Merced. Um, we studied polymeric materials and bioelastomers um, together. And he has a wide range of research interests um, ranging from biomolecular materials, polymers and phase transformation. Um, Christopher earned a BA and PhD in metallurgy and materials uh, science at University of Cambridge. Um, and he is UC Merced's eighth um, first founding faculty and he served as UC Merced's um, first, first vice provost for undergraduate education and then went on to serve as the first undergraduate program chair and then um, the department chair for material science and engineering. Um, without further ado, Dr. Fer, uh, Dr. Christopher Viney speaking about how material science and engineering enables gravitational and space research. So take it away. Well, Anna, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I only have to make one slight correction, and that is because my degrees were in the UK, it was metallurgy and not metallurgy. But uh... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can never resist the temptation to tease Anna slightly. And uh, what, what what has to be said was that I, you know one could not have wished for you know and and you know student sort of sounds like you know there's some, there's somebody sort of in the in the bowels in the basement somewhere and just doing what the professor says. It's uh, you were such you were much more than that, Anna. You know, I mean, you you were a a a a, a collaborator in the best sense of the word. And um, I will, amongst your many achievements, I will always flag you for being the person who, uh, with energy and determination, went and translated 200 pages of French literature in the pursuit of an idea. So um, anyway, thank you, Anna. Uh, I'm going to try and share a screen now. So that means uh, I need to find a share screen button, I guess. Um, and let's hope it works. And just making it clear in case uh, anybody's joined, we are recording this. So uh, this, this is being recorded. Okay, um, so hopefully I should be able to share my own screen here. <laughs> let's try that one. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my, um, my slides. And there should be one very large title slide. Uh, for those of you who are counting and want to know when this is going to be over, there are 48 slides in total. So here is the first. And I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about materials science and engineering, and uh, particularly in the context of gravitational and space research, because of course that is what the hosting organization is interested in. And what you see here is uh, a view from the UC Merced campus and uh, looking towards the mountains and it looks wonderful and empty. And so some people might think, my goodness, you guys are out in the middle of nowhere. Now, this is just looking in one direction. So uh, you know, California is very keen on maintaining uh, you know, good ecology and sustainability and in environmental uh, concerns. And so uh, the land to the east of the campus is preserved. And so we actually have a nice uninterrupted view towards the mountains, the Sierra Nevada. Now, if you look in the other direction, you will actually see buildings and, and a small city. Um, so uh, yes, Christopher Viney, that's my name. And um, I was appointed at UC Merced when I joined, I was appointed as a professor of engineering because we didn't have departments in those days. And so that's why my title doesn't actually reflect a direct departmental affiliation. But yes, today is going to be all about materials science and engineering. I understand that the audience today and also the audience for the YouTube version of this uh, presentation, the audience could be very broad and we may have people from middle school um, all the way up to graduate school. And so there are times in this talk when I'll get a little bit technical and there are times when I'll be very non-technical. And so hopefully there's a little bit in it for everybody, uh, you know, persevere to the end please and follow it. And you know, even if you're a, even if you're a professor, and I know that uh, so Alvaro is going to be a professor very soon, 
uh, maybe if some of the ideas are very basic, maybe you can use them in your teaching or for those of you who are graduate students, you can use them when you're a TA. So why do materials matter? Okay, so materials are all about matter, right? So of course they matter, but, but why, why is material science important? So every professor of every discipline is going to, they, they get paid to be passionate about their discipline. And of course, they'll put their discipline in the middle of the universe and everything else has to organize itself around it. So here you have material science and engineering surrounded by, clustered by um, other types of engineering. But, you know, I don't think I'm just being partisan here. I think I'm being very realistic when I put material science in the middle, because what we do directly impacts aerospace engineering. And I put that at the top because it's related to what else we're doing today. But also it's related to mechanical and biomedical and civil and electrical and chemical engineering. All those kinds of engineering work with stuff. They need machines and devices and probes and computers and the communication devices and processing facilities. And all of those, you've got to make them out of something. So you can't do the other sorts of engineering without materials, you see. And so that is why I feel very justified to put materials in the middle. So you know, if you're new to materials, if you've never heard of it, you will have done by the end of today's presentation. And uh, hopefully you will see that it's sort of really in the thick of things. It's in the middle of things. Uh, material scientists have no trouble getting jobs. I'll put it that way. OK, so uh, in a nutshell, if you needed the, the quick version of what I just said, all technological progress, all the progress that has happened, that is happening, that will happen, depends on available materials. So very quickly, before I get onto the, the aerospace and the, uh, and the gravitation side of things, um, well, gravitation, material science is attractive, right? I hope Anna warned you about the bad puns. Uh, what is material science and engineering? Okay, well, in a nutshell, Okay, it is, it is a discipline, it's a field which applies fundamental principles of physics and chemistry and increasingly biology to design and produce materials that have combinations of properties. They behave in ways, in complex ways to achieve a particular use. Okay, and the complex ways, the properties could be mechanical or optical or electrical or magnetic or electrochemical. Uh, they could relate to biocompatibility, sustainability these days, affordability, very important, very important, ethical sourcing. You know, where do we get stuff from? And you know, who's, who's paying the price for it? And is it, can, can we source it ethically and to the least detriment of the planet? Okay, and so all of those considerations come into the choice and the selection and the use of materials. So what we do in material science and engineering is that we are concerned with which atoms do we use, which molecules do we use, how do we organize those atoms and molecules into solid materials usually, uh, what do the ingredients cost, and this could be, uh, there could be a, 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 a material cost literally, or a financial cost, or even a human cost, so you know, what goes into getting the ingredients and the processes, uh, what's the environmental cost? to uh, produce particular materials. So we care about the effects of the environment on materials because the environment isn't always kind to our materials. The environment will corrode our materials, okay? So, so a lot of material science is concerned with preserving the properties of materials. It's not surprising really, because you know, so many of the metals that we use, they start out, we get them from rocks, right? Some oxides and sulfides. And we're really borrowing time when we purify, when we extract and purify those metals because, you know, thermodynamically, they want to be oxides and sulfides. So it's only a matter of time because that's what they're going to become again, right? And so the environment will be detrimental to, to materials. And of course, materials and the, the extraction is an energy intensive process uh, in extracting materials and in shaping them and in turning them into final products. There's usually quite a high energy cost. So how can we minimize that? What alternative materials can we use to minimize energy use and to maximize recyclability? And very important too, how do we know that we've got stuff with the structure and properties that we want? So there's a lot of characterization, a lot of microscopy, a lot of spectroscopy, right? a lot of mechanical testing. 
to see how whether the material we have is actually the material that we want and whether it's going to do what we need it to do. So that is really, so material science and engineering is fun if you can't decide between physics and chemistry. Well, there's, there's both of them in there. That's, that's how I ended up doing material science. I like physics, I like chemistry. This is the applied end of both of those. What's biology doing in there? Well, we're learning lessons from nature, biomimetics. Nature makes fantastic stuff and process it, processes it in fantastically interesting ways. So biology is a great mentor for us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was somebody needing to say something? I, I heard a voice. <laughs> Anna's frame lit up very briefly, but I guess not. Okay, I will continue. Um, so now this is this is not an advertisement anymore, right? The previous slide was kind of an advertisement for the subject. Uh, the whole talk is going to be one, but a little bit more subtly than than that very sort of in your face. This is what materials is. So here's a photograph I took from the University of California Merced campus very early in the morning on the 30th of April this year. And now if you're looking at this on your phone, it may be difficult to, um, to see uh, you know, things in the sky. So I'm going to label them for you. There are five planets in this view. Okay, and starting at the top right, so there's Saturn and Mars and Jupiter and Venus very close together. And Earth, let's not forget Earth. Okay, so there's a line of planets. And that's why I got up really early in the morning uh, to go to campus to get this nice view of the, what would it have been about the southwestern sky, southwestern, southeastern sky, excuse me. Um, and um, particularly, you notice that Jupiter and Venus are very close together. And you know, I'm, a, I'm a nerd when it comes to wanting to take pictures of interesting things. I'm a nerd when it comes to being interested in astronomy. And so I had to go and get this picture of Jupiter and Venus very close in the sky together. Okay, And here's a picture which uh, there's a website uh, mentioned on the bottom of the frame here. But this is a picture of, of the uh, configuration of the planets uh, on that morning. And the website is one that draws these pictures for you. So you can take a sort of looking down on the solar system, see where everything is. And so those lines there are to Jupiter and Venus and Mars and Saturn from Earth. And so it shows why you would see them in the order that I showed them in the sky. Um, actually, uh, Neptune is also, uh, would, if, if I had a telescope, I'd have been able to see Neptune in the picture as well, but it's too faint to photograph with my camera under those circumstances. So why am I showing you this picture? Well, because now this is also taken with my camera, it's zooming in on Jupiter and Venus, and I've labeled um, some features in there, so Jupiter and Venus, obviously, and Ganymede, Io, and Callisto are three of the Galilean moons of, um, of Jupiter. The fourth one, why Galilean? Because they're named after Galileo, who first observed them through a telescope. And the fourth one is kind of hiding behind Jupiter, or maybe it's hiding in front of Jupiter, but you can't pick it out in this picture. Um, bonus prize if somebody knows the name of that, that extra moon, that, we, well, that fourth moon that we can't see. Now, um, if you look at this, you'll notice that the moons of Jupiter are stretched out a little bit. If, if, this, if this picture was a map and you were looking at it, so if you drew a line in a kind of uh, southwest to northeast direction, you'd see the moons are stretched just a little bit along that direction. So is Jupiter, actually. And that's because of the exposure. I don't have a tracker for my camera. So the, the, the things are moving as I've got this longish exposure here. But if you look at Venus, you'll notice it's actually not stretched in that direction noticeably. The main thing of, about the shape of Venus is it seems to be more like the moon that isn't quite, uh, isn't quite full yet. And I can emphasize that by superimposing some circles on the picture. So if you look at Jupiter, you can just see a little bit of a stretch from the southwest to northeast stretch. If you look at Venus, you'll notice there's a good chunk on the right-hand side of Venus that seems to be missing. It's very obvious when I put these circles around it for reference. And again, because some of you are probably watching this on tiny screens, let me zoom in on that. Now, full disclosure, I physically moved Venus towards Jupiter in this picture. So the previous picture, let's go back to it. This is a single exposure, uh, one frame. This is taking Venus and bringing it in a little bit towards Jupiter so I can blow things up and still get everything into the same picture for you to see. And now the, um, the, the, the 
the trends that I mentioned, you can see the the tracking, you can see the fact that, that things are, are tracking in a particular direction, but you can also see that Venus very definitely is not round. And this picture, I was really excited to be able to take this photograph because in this picture are two of the most fundamental astronomical observations that basically put science and the world from an Earth-centered perspective into a sort of cosmic kind of perspective. So the fact that Jupiter has things, moons orbiting around it, basically was a, was a big deal because it shows that not everything that orbits around stuff is orbiting around the Earth. There's other things out there that has stuff orbiting around it. And looking at Venus, Venus actually has phases just like our moon. So Venus, the shape changes as you watch it. Look at a different day. It, it, it turns, it'll be, be a full Venus. It'll be a nice big round thing. And uh, look at a different day and you'll see that it's crescent Venus. It's a skinny kind of crescent. And the only way that that can be possible is if Venus and the Earth are both going around the sun and Venus is between us and the sun or the orbit of Venus is between us and the sun. OK, so yes, Venus can be further than the sun if it's going around the other side, but the orbit that Venus follows is closer to the sun than the orbit that we follow. So it's kind of exciting to get in one picture the two, um, the, the two observations, or two of the important observations that Galileo made. So uh, let's start thinking about this a little bit. So here is a slide of Galileo's telescope. I stole this slide from the... Uh, uh, Galileo Museum's website, okay, and they're in Florence and Italy, and you can, those of you with good eyesight can read along the bottom of the screen and find out where to find these people. And you also have a picture of my camera, which I stole from the Canon website. Okay, and if you look at the objective lens of uh, the, the light gathering lens of Galileo telescope, 51 millimeters in diameter, um, the lens on my camera is about 40 millimeters in diameter. So Galileo's telescope technically has a better light gathering capability than my camera, just because there's a, a wider lens on the front. Um, but because of the, what people understood about optics in those days and the fairly simple kind of lens system, so Galileo managed a magnification of 14 or thereabouts, 14, 15, 16 for his different telescopes. My camera can actually go up to 65X, and then I've got even uh, the capability of enlarging things via my computer here. Enlarging doesn't necessarily give me more detail, but I can, uh, you know, I, I should be able to get images that are comparable to or better than Galileo's with a camera. The question then is how, how come Galileo did so well with a telescope that could only magnify 15x? Well, we have to remember that he was in Italy uh, in the, what would that have been? That would have been the very early 17th century when he uh, was doing his observations. And the air quality was probably a lot better than it is in the Central Valley in California. So with that background and that transition, so here's a material scientist looking in the sky, thinking about space and, uh, and gravitation and, and all these things. So comes to mind the following question. What is, or was, or will be the most important material in space research? Does anybody want to uh, make a comment on that? Well, I can't find my chat. It's got to be here somewhere. Uh, but if, if people want to put a comment in the chat, uh, what do you, what do you think is the most um, important material in space research? Okay, so the mirror, it's, it's an interesting thought. So um, the mirror is a device. So I'm gonna be really picky here and say, you, you could be right, but the, the material is a thing. I'm sorry, the, the mirror is a thing. And now, you know, what's it made out of? Of course, Galileo's telescope used lenses. It didn't use mirrors. Uh, my camera uses lenses, not mirrors. But um, so, so Shmita, thank you for uh, thank you for attempting an answer here. I, 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 you, you, you're the bold pioneer who was the first person to answer a question about science in this presentation. So thank you for doing that. Now, everybody else. Uh, 
Is it some sort of multifunctional composite material? This is from somebody called iPhone. Uh, <laughs> all right. So if it's an iPhone talking to me, it must be Siri, right? OK, so uh, we have good ideas. Is it the mirror? Uh, <laughs> hi, John. Um, so we have, is it a composite material? What is or was or will be the most important material in space research? OK, uh, well, we've had a couple of suggestions here. So the answer is, of course, there is no right answer because it depends on your point of view or what you're trying to build or which period of time you're looking at. But I am going to make a case that glass certainly would be a contender. Many people, when they think about space research, they think, well, I've got to make you know, the rocket engines or the, you know, the tiles on the space shuttle or the, you know, the re-entry shield or whatever it is. And so, yes, of course, all those materials are important too. But you know, we, I don't think we would have gone into space if it wasn't for glass. Okay, so you know, this is just uh, me expressing an opinion and giving you real reasons for my opinion. Uh, but you know, the, the discussion could go long into the evening, right? And, and, and long into next week. But why glass? Because what did people make with glass? They made spectacles. So people could read a little bit better and write a little bit better. And it was the spectacle makers who made the lenses for the first telescopes, actually. So telescopes, the first telescopes used glass lenses. Mirrors came later. Microscopes and magnifying glasses, just this whole idea of studying science blossomed due to the uses of glass. Uh, laboratory glassware, the chemists, you had to make the, the idea of the, first of all, simple glassware that you could blow into flasks and blow into various shapes for making equipment, but then borosilicate glass that you could take to high temperatures, you know, pyrex and that sort of thing. Light bulbs, the fact that one could actually and relatively affordably push the boundaries of the day um, and actually you know, research and science could be done not just when there was daylight. Okay, and you could actually have artificial sources of light to power your microscope so that you could actually get better quality images when you're looking at the materials that you're going to be building things out of. Windows. We still need windows on airplanes even and uh, spacecraft. And so uh, glass, very useful there. For the displays and all the equipment, um, for the fiber optic cables that connect pieces of equipment that we send information along. Um, Photovoltaic cells have a glass layer on them, protecting them. Um, dye lubricants. I, so th those of you who, who are um, interested in foreign languages, you might have thought they were sort of some form of German. Die lubricants. No, it's dye lubricants. Dye as in the dye that you form the material through. And thermal barriers. So space shuttle tiles, things like that. Um, and I put these last two in italics because I'm just going to um, elaborates just a little bit more on those, uh, give you a little bit more sort of materials knowledge on that. Okay, so dye lubricants. Uh, so I stole this picture from a paper who I have referenced here if you want to go and read more about it. But this is, this is an extruding device. And so um, what we have is uh, trying to make a, a tube here. Okay, so the black, the darkest stuff that you see in this picture, it's a billet. Okay, so it's a, it's, it's a blob of, uh, it's a cylinder of some sort of alloy. And this could be a titanium alloy that's, or, or an aluminum alloy that's going to be used in a spacecraft. And it's being turned into a tube. Okay, and tubes are great ways to cut down on the weight but maintain the rigidity in terms of the, the sort of structure that you build. And so you notice that there's a thin layer here of glass. And so I've Put a box around the glass pad here just to so there's a bunch of glass sitting here ahead of the billet and then the mandrel which is this very golden thing in the middle that's for making sure that there's a hole up the middle of the tube that's being extruded and so the mandrel so pulls the billet material and the glass material through the dye which is the green thing now glass we do not think of as a lubricant because it's sort of scratchy and, and brittle and hard but not at the temperatures where we do this sort of extrusion. And so glass becomes a nice lubricating viscous fluid. And so it helps to cut down on the wear between the metal and the dye. So you've got metal being pushed through metal and that would stick, but the glass prevents it from sticking. And the glass also pr provides a coating. So as this is extruded out into air, 
the air does not oxidize this tube as it's being extruded. And then the glass, everything cools down and the glass just flakes off very, very easily and you've got your metal tube. So glass, even useful as a lubricant, you see. And this is something that material scientists are actually quite good at. We, we, we're quite good at finding ways to use materials that maybe traditionally even you know, might not have thought of using. But yeah, glass doesn't come to mind as, a, as an easy lubricant, but it is widely used in metals processing. And the thermal barriers, another use of glass. So the space shuttle tile, 90% um, of which is air, but the other 10% is silica, SiO2, glass. Okay, and what it does is it's necessary for the heat insulation, it resists thermal shock, so you can change the temperature quickly and it doesn't break, and of course it has to be lightweight, and if it is 90% air, well that helps, with the, uh, that helps with the weight. So again, glass doing its thing in a high-tech way. Now putting this slide in, uh, if you haven't seen this, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a What's the word I'm looking for? An epic, perhaps is the right word people use these days. Uh, YouTube video, the link is on the slide here. And what the uh, demonstrator has done here is taken space shuttle material, put it into a furnace at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. I will leave you to convert it to Celsius if you need to. Uh, 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulled it out of the furnace, and within 10 seconds of it coming out of the furnace, he's picking it up and holding it in his hand in a darkened room. And what you can see, this stuff is so hot that it's glowing. It is sending out radiation and you can see it, including uh, you know, almost sort of white hot still from the middle. But the edges have cooled enough and the transfer of heat through the material itself, the actual conduction of heat is so low that he can hold up that cube like that without burning himself. So a demonstration of what glass, if you organize it in the right sort of way, what it can actually do for you. So this is something also that material scientists are good at is we, are, we, we take building blocks of stuff, and in this case glass, and we turn it into different things. So sandstone, which you see in Table Mountain on the top right there. This is a view that I saw quite often when I was a kid because I, I did grow up in South Africa. This is for, at least when I, when I pretend to have grown up, right? People who know me well maybe will challenge that view, but I, I did live in South Africa when I was a kid. And there is uh, Table Mountain and it's sandstone. And sandstone is what? Well, it's, it's mainly silica, right? SiO2. And depending on what you do with the silica, you could get the, the glass on a halogen uh, light bulb here that you might use in a projector, or you could get um, the, 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 the tiles on a space shuttle. Same stuff. It's just been organized in different ways. So if I had to explain that aspect of material science, I would maybe show people the picture on the top left here. So there's a panda, right? It's made out of Lego bricks. You can actually get, there's all sorts of software online now where you take any picture and you submit it to the software and it will give you ideas about how you could construct that image out of Lego bricks. And in this case, the panda bear here, if you took exactly those same bricks, you threw them up in the air and you caught them in just the right order, you put them down, you could make that tiger. Or you could get a portrait of Neil Armstrong. Or you could, you know, anything you like from the same building blocks, the same set of building blocks. And this is what we do in material science, you see. So what we get, yes, it depends on which blocks we use, but it also depends on how these blocks are organized, how they're arranged. So all the materials that we make are actually made from a very small set of building blocks, just arranged in very clever ways. So what are those building blocks? Well, look at a periodic table and you've seen them all, at least all the ones that we know about. So here is a short list <laughs> of aspects of space research that depend on materials. So which aspects depend on materials? Uh, if you want to read more about it, uh, uh, this book that I reference here, uh, The Aerospace Materials and Applications, uh, edited by Billiard Bat, uh, 2018, relatively new, re relatively in-date book. Of course, things change really quickly in this field, so you know, hopefully it'll be a new edition soon. Um, but this is only you know, four years, four years four, or less than four years out, so um, fairly up to date. And in preparing for today's presentation, 
I was very happy to find this book because, of course, I'm looking for perspectives, other people's perspectives and resources and things. And uh, I recommend this book to anybody now who's actually doing, uh, who, who needs to know some material science, period, just somebody who needs to know material science, but who also then wants to contextualize it uh, in, in aerospace and, and space research. So what I've listed here is just the chapter titles from this book. And it gives you an idea of the sort of range of materials use. And so, uh, you know, so what are the, just run through the, I'm not going to read you every chapter, chapter title in detail here, but you know, what overall does one look for in an aerospace um, uh, space research material that's going to be used in some sort of uh, practical application there? Um, how does one go about selecting materials? What is the algorithm for selecting, the process for selecting? How can we harness nanotechnology? Um, how do we use materials in regular aircraft? How do we use them in spacecraft? How do you use them in rockets? How do we use them in exploration systems? That means, how are we going to, what are we going to do when we've got to send a mission far away and we can't even take all the materials with us? You know, how are we going to find materials on the way? How are we going to process them? Okay, you can't. You probably can't lift everything you need for a ten-year journey and take it with you. You've got to kind of be creative on, as you go. Live off the land, except the land is now what you find in space. Um, thermal protection systems, um, aero engine materials, and um, all, all sorts of just all sorts of applications. And then I got to thinking about this, and this is something I encourage in everybody. You know, critical thinking. So when you read something, okay, it's, is this is it right? Is it complete? Uh, you know, what else could we be doing? And it very quickly occurred to me that this list is not complete. So I would love to see a second edition which has other chapters, which would be maybe the infrastructure, you know, when you launch. Well, it, it's, a, it's a very tough environment for whatever you're leaving on the ground as this rocket is blasting off sort of next to it, right? And, and it's got a, a lot of thermal management there as well and vibration management and stresses and strains and things. So what do you make the launch pads out of? Um, what do you make the equipment out of? There's all sorts of detectors and devices and not just, uh, not just cameras and things, but uh, spectrometers and, and just all sorts of devices, which they have to be built out of materials and materials that gather the information but don't interfere with the information. What about spacesuits? What about wearable electronics for the, the astronauts are maybe wearing some sort of monitoring devices all the time to keep track of their health? What about materials for storing information and processing information? It, it, it goes on and on and on. Go back to that second slide that I showed with the MSE tile in the middle. All these things need materials and an understanding of them. All right, well, you know, what's special about space? You know, it's big, right? But how does that affect material science? So hardware exposed to space must withstand all aspects of the space environment. And that means they've got to work in a vacuum. Uh, the temperature ranges, you know, are you facing the sun? Are you facing away from the sun? Uh, uh, are you near another star maybe someday? You're facing away from it. Uh, you know, things can get hot and cold through a large range very quickly. Um, all sort of charged particles which can interact with materials and damage materials. Ultraviolet radiation, okay, and that can be very damaging to polymers. Plasma effects, well, what does that mean? You can get all sorts of ionized molecules in atmospheres and upper reaches of the atmosphere, and these can be reactive in various ways and, and interact with materials. Atomic oxygen, there's an area near the top of our atmosphere where ultraviolet light energizes um, oxygen into, um, into atomic oxygen. And that is exceedingly reactive and damaging to materials that have to fly through it. Uh, what about just simply the impact of uh, little pieces of space dust? And maybe it's uh, because it's up there and it was out, up there all the time, or maybe it's some junk that we created, and, you know, it's some, something left over from something that we put into orbit. But the physical damage uh, is something that materials have to Something very small, moving at very high speeds, carries a lot of energy, right? And getting the repair, you know, the 10 year warranty, right? So, can we send somebody out for warranty repair 24 7? No. And certainly not when it's, uh, when it's a much longer um, expedition than just putting something into orbit. So, these constraints are very important, and they're challenges for materials in space. Couple of examples based on what we see going on now um, in the news, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. 
a couple of materials examples here. So the and I've the the link here, uh, the NASA uh, link, uh, do follow up on that. What I've gleaned here are the pictures and just a little bit of ideas from there. But I'm really impressed with the amount of information that NASA actually has available online. There's so much material for teaching and 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 instruction and outreach. Okay, the main mirror. What's it made out of? Well, beryllium. Okay, what's beryllium? Well, look on the periodic table. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. It's the fourth element, so it's actually quite light. Okay, and beryllium, uh, we don't, there's not a lot of it, so the total amount of beryllium refined on Earth in any one year is only, only, a, few, only a few hundred tons, I believe. But the stiffness is 50% greater than that of steel. Okay, if you want to make a mirror, if you want panels on this mirror and you don't want them to flex, you want them to be able to maintain their shape, well, high stiffness is important. Low density, 75% less than steel. In other words, density is a quarter, approximately, a quarter of that of steel. And it holds its shape over a wide temperature range. And it's also a good conductor of electricity and heat. So electricity conductor, well, that's useful because you certainly don't want charges building up on any one location on the mirror because that could affect the operation. So you want any charges to dissipate easily. And any hot spot would dissipate very, very quickly. So beryllium is a really good for its weight. It's one of the best conductors of heat. And then it's coated with gold to particularly improve the reflection of infrared light, which is the main part of the uh, spectrum in which the James Webb telescope works. And here it is, okay, uh, drum roll, glass, amorphous silicon dioxide coating because it is scratch resistant. Okay, and so that is, uh, that's a basic material science of the main mirror. Then there's a sun shield, and that is to help with thermal management. And um, it's largely made out of kapton, which is a polymer. It's very heat resistant, thermally stable over a wide range of temperatures. It's uh, flexible, it's lightweight. It doesn't change shape with temperature very much, low thermal expansion coefficient. So uh, enthusiasts of this material, you know, I'm tempted to, to you know, the famous line, captain, oh, captain, my captain, right? Some, some, some of you will, will get the reference. Um, it's coated with aluminum to reflect heat and light and to be conducting, again, to dissipate any space charges. And there's a doped silicon coating on the top two layers. Well, what's top? Top in this case means closest to the sun, which it's trying to uh, protect the telescope from. And uh, the doped silicon has a high emissivity. And what that means is if any radiation that it doesn't reflect, it gets rid of, it, it re-radiates very, very quickly. So just some of the constraints and some of the, the, the interests in a couple of the uh, components of the James Webb Space Telescope. Couldn't do it without material science. I've said it before, let me say it again. All right, so you've seen the slide before. It's the only slide that I'm going to repeat, but it emphasizes that uh, we need the materials to do the job. So I'm going to take a step backwards in time now again, and this is a little bit more with a focus on people who might be coming here from, uh, from coming to see the presentation or the online uh, YouTube uh, posting. Somebody might be from a middle, a middle school background and, and doesn't have all the sort of technical terminology. So let's, uh, let's look at aircraft, okay? We're a little bit more familiar with aircraft. And so airplanes, uh, Wright Brothers aircraft in the top left there. And, um, you know, so, so planes got bigger, they got faster, the jet engine came along, and eventually the sort of rocket propulsion system that we put ourselves into orbit with came along. And so we've gone in the space of less than 100 years from barely getting off the ground to easily getting into space and getting uh, probes, actually, which have even left the solar system. So some of the two Voyager probes are you know, far, far away and uh, still traveling. And what we've done, we started with wood and cloth and string and wire, so it's the early airplane. The spokes on the wheels of some of the early flyers, the spokes were actually made out of string. Go figure. How do you make a spoke? Does that work? Yes, it does. Okay, if you think about where the tensions are being carried, yes, it does work. But we've gone to metals and ceramics and synthetic polymers and synthetic composites. So it's been a materials advance. This airplane here, uh, you may recognize, it's the uh, Spruce Goose, which was um, uh, invented by Howard Hughes. 
absolutely huge airplane and uh, you know sort of on the on the scale comparable to a Boeing 747 in terms of some of its dimensions it flew once briefly it got not off the ground it got out of the ocean this is a seaplane it got up flew a few hundred yards and landed and that was it it only flew the one time I believe um, somebody may wish to fact check that but I, I think it only flew once um, and one of the limitations was because they were still trying to build it with wood and so this plane is called the spruce goose because it was made literally out of spruce the wood now you can imagine it's a seaplane so the wood is not going to keep its shape necessarily as well as you'd like it to um, but the other uh, constraint is that something that big I'm going to make you very dizzy and just go back a little bit here. So look at the right flyer and its short little wings, and then look at the spruce goose and its great big long wings. And you can't scale using the same material because the longer the wing, it's like a cantilever beam, the more it bends. Okay, so, so size and behavior of structures do not scale in simple proportion. So if all else remains equal, doubling the length of a wing leads to an eightfold increase in the deflection of the wingtip. So of course, you know, the wing's just going to bend and bend and not work very well in terms of getting lift. So you've got to change the stiffness and the weight. And that is why wood wasn't going to cut it anymore. They had to, you have to move on to other designs and materials. Okay. So we talk about mechanical behavior like stiffness and strength and toughness and fatigue resistance. And then another list of properties. Now, this list looks like a little bit like uh, the list of properties I had on what was probably the third slide in this presentation, you know, things like density and thermal properties and whether you can process it and join it and whether it lasts and these sort of things. But there's some more, slightly more specific versions of those in the list here as pertaining to aircraft. The point being that you have to bear the whole environment of the material in mind. So strength may not be enough. You may have to worry about strength and corrosion resistance and weight and thermal expansion all in the same material. So just some vocabulary here. So you know, the grad students hopefully know this already. Um, uh, some others may not. What do we mean by stress? You know, the grad students certainly know about stress, right? <laughs> not, not just the mechanical engineering version of it. Um, stress. Okay, so if you take a bar of material here and you load it, you apply a force along the green arrows on a cross-sectional area indicated by the blue area, then stress is that force divided by the area over which you apply the force. And I've color coded it here so you can really see how this equation is put together. So that is stress. It's a measure of how concentrated the force is on the particular area of the material. Strain is how the material changes its shape in response to the force. So it started off with a particular length and it got longer. Original length in blue and the change in length in green. And you divide one by the other, the change by the original, that is the strain. It's a measure of shape change. And then you can plot the stress against the strain. And so to get a strain, to get more stretch, you generally need more stress, that makes sense. So you expect this curve to be an increasing sort of curve. More stress to get more shape change. But the simple plot here, now you know what stress and strain are, the simple plot, you can define lots of materials properties from it. So the yield strength is where it stops behaving like a spring. You see initially the green part of the line, it's elastic. The, the stretch is proportional to the strain. And if you let go of the load it'll just go back to what the original length was again so this is elastic behavior then it stops behaving elastically and you follow the blue part of the curve the light blue part which is plastic so it's not proportional stress and strain anymore and where the elastic changes to plastic that's called the yield strength and sometimes when people say strength that's what they mean by strength the yield strength or you can talk about the breaking strength when the material actually breaks okay it falls apart it's gone so there are two ways you can define strength, at least two ways. There are others, but this is a, you know, this is, this is a good intro to a couple of ways you can do it. The slope of this springy bit here, okay, where the elastic part, the slope is the stiffness, okay, or also called Young's modulus. And the area, the dark blue area under the entire curve is proportional to the toughness. It's the energy per unit volume absorbed in breaking the material. 
So this curve, I don't see it, I don't really see it in the textbooks, but you know, this one plot summarizes a whole lot of different mechanical properties for you. And so no strength and stiffness and toughness are not the same thing. We use these words kind of interchangeably in everyday language, but uh, they're not the same thing. There's also something called fracture toughness. That's not just toughness, that's fracture toughness. And that is if you've got a, a little crack in the material and you apply the load, does that crack grow easily? Okay, if a crack does not grow, if, a, if it's really difficult to move that crack through the material, then the material has a high fracture toughness. All right, so we can have some fun here and look at some different materials properties. So there's a, various things that may or may not happen to our airplane as we look at it. Okay, so you want the wings to be stiff, but you don't, you don't want them to bend. You want them to be strong, you don't want them to buckle. You want them to be tough. You don't want cracks to go through them easily. You want them to be light, okay? And so then various things here, what will happen if it's not stiff enough, the wings will bend. If the yield strength is too low, the wheels will bend permanently. Uh, if the fracture toughness is too low, the wing will fall off. And if the density is too high, the plane will never get off the ground, right? So you can think about these consequences. Or, you know, because since we have Photoshop these days, we can look at, um, one of the stealth bombers here. So the plane on the top of this picture is doing just fine. The one on the bottom, the fracture toughness isn't good enough. And so that plane is not doing fine. Go back to the top picture again, the same, but now we've got the fracture toughness is fine. The, on, on the bottom picture, the, uh, the wings are not breaking off, but they're bending. And so aerodynamically, this probably wouldn't work. Okay, so it's good in material science, as in any subject, to learn the technical words and have a good clear picture of the difference between these technical terms. Okay, and so I encourage you to, to do that, whatever your actual discipline is. All right, so a little bit earlier, I talked about building blocks and materials people are good at taking different sets of building blocks and making you know, everything we have has to be made out of the same set of building blocks. Um, so what limits the maximum strength and stiffness? It's the energy between bonds of the building blocks, and they're all on the periodic table. So bond energy, we can, if you plot the energy of the bond, that's a vertical axis, versus the distance between atoms, you can imagine having two atoms, they maybe want to react, but they're far apart in space, okay? They don't know anything about each other. You bring them closer and closer and closer. And some sort of, if they wanted to bond, they're going to be some sort of attraction. And so the attractive energy lowers the energy. So the curve that says attraction is going down to the bottom. But you can't put atoms right on top of each other because they get in each other's way. And so there's going to be a repulsion as well that increases with as, as you bring the distance smaller, the repulsion goes up. And you've got this battle between repulsion and attraction. And the Adding the two curves together, you get the curve in the middle, which has got that little well in it, that little dip. And the depth of that energy well will relate to the breaking strength, okay, relates to the breaking strength. So the deeper the well, the more energetically favorable that bond is, the stronger it will be. And the sharpness, how, how sharply curved that well is, relates to the stiffness. So how quickly do you need to change the energy as you're changing the separation of the atoms? So that's relating to the stiffness. Okay. Now, the actual strength of materials and the toughness isn't just dependent on the theoretical bond strength, which I just described, but it also um, can depend very strongly on defects. And so the defects, they could be right down at the atomic or molecular length scale, but they also occur at different length scales. So material scientists care a lot about controlling the types and concentrations and distribution of defects in materials. Okay, so... One example of a defect is called a dislocation. And so I've got a lattice here. You can see it's a simple, it's a simple cubic three-dimensional uh, lattice here. Not all lattices look like this, but it works for illustration. And you'll notice right in the middle of this, I've got half a plane of atoms. It just suddenly stops. So one of the planes, it starts at the top, it goes through, and it suddenly stops in the middle here. And so that's where, where a plane, the other half of it is missing. That is called an edge dislocation. There are other kinds of dislocations too, but the edge dislocation is a nice easy one to visualize. And so uh, here, if you follow this picture, go along the top row and then the mid, second row, third row, fourth row. You see at the very top, you're applying a shear stress to the material. You're sort of pushing the top half of it to the right and the bottom half to the left. So you're, you're sharing it. And what happens is instead of the whole block of material sliding over in a single step to give you the picture on the bottom right, 
That doesn't happen in a single step. What happens is that it basically moves one atomic half plane at a time. Okay, and so it bends over a little bit. Hopefully you can see my cursor as I'm, as I'm illustrating my cursor. So breaks, uh, bends over a bit more, links up with the next uh, half plane along. This process keeps happening. Okay, and so what we're doing is we're basically propagating a half plane through the material. And that takes less energy than sharing the entire material at once. And this is why on my chart of mechanical properties, it's why the yield stress is lower than the breaking stress, because what I'm showing here is the process of, of something changing shape by yielding. And you don't have to break the whole thing straight through at once. You just move one half plane at a time via dislocations. So dislocations control the yield strength of the material. Other defects on the greater length scale, okay, this is now not, not at the atomic level, here's a 10 micrometer bar, okay, what's a micrometer? It's one one thousandth of a millimeter, right? So look at the millimeter on your ruler, chop one of those up into a thousand pieces, you've got one micrometer, take 10 of them, that's the length of the bar on the bottom here. So what I'm looking at are crystals in a metal. These are single crystals in a metal. Of course, they're much bigger than the atomic scale, as we can see here, but there are boundaries between the crystals. Okay, there are the boundaries. And those are defects as well, because the material isn't quite as well stuck together at the boundaries as it is in the middle of the crystal grains. So those boundaries, you can think of them as weaknesses. And this controlling those grain boundaries has had a huge effect on the development of turbine blades and jet engines. And the, the first jet engine turbine blades are like the one on the left, where if you look through a microscope at the metal, it's just a whole, you can see individual crystals and those boundaries are weak. Much stronger um, and tougher blades were produced by solidifying the metal along, you make the solidification happen in one direction. And so the grains grow and you'll notice that these crystals here, the boundaries are along a direction that is not going to break easily when you pull, when you load along the length of that turbine blade. Of course, the blade's spinning round in the engine, so it's trying to stretch, but you don't have boundaries perpendicular to the stretch direction, so you strengthen the material overall. Now, the best turbine blades consist of only a single crystal of metal. There are no grain boundaries. You've got rid of them completely. The highlight of, of jet engine development was the person who figured out a means to make the turbine blade crystallize from a metal such that the whole blade consists of only one crystal. Okay, moving up in length scale again to the length scale of entire airplanes. Holes in sort of macro scale. And this wonderful aircraft here, it was a British aircraft, the first commercial passenger jet aircraft, got there before Boeing. The only trouble is that they discovered in the design of this aircraft when they originally started off with square windows that this was really good at concentrating stresses. And so these, there were some really bad crashes, some accidents where these planes fell apart in midair because of the holes as the defect in the metals causing stresses to concentrate at the corners and bringing down the aircraft. So sometimes being first isn't actually going to guarantee success because you know, in engineering to some extent is, is a process of learning from your mistakes. You try to avoid mistakes, but when you make them, you learn and the next person to come along does better. This is an example from my house, okay, just to, to illustrate how this happens, not just in, in aircraft, but in everyday materials as well. The stucco on my house, very soon after the house was built, it cracked, of course, you know, dried out, cracked and in directions that you would predict nowadays that we understand how stress concentrated work in materials. And it's easily with plaster like this, it doesn't, doesn't make the house fall down, you can just fill the crack and, and carry on, right? Okay, so uh, you know I've got 48 slides, so I'm getting near the end here, um, as I'm also getting near the end of the allotted time. Uh, I haven't said much about gravitational research, but I, I'm going to put some in here just for fun. Um, and this is a little bit technical, um, but the, the, those of you who are interested may want to go and read, first of all, the paper, the research paper on the left of your slide here. And this is from UC Merced, um, 2010 paper, I think it is. Yes, 2010, from our physics department. And what our physicists there were saying, so it's one of the, Stephen Minter was a grad student and uh, uh, the second name is a professor at uh, Boston University, and interestingly, he's a, he's a professor of theology and physics, and then one of our physics professors um, here at UC Merced. 
Um, and the question they were asking was, could you make a mirror for gravitational waves? Because much as you use, and somebody asked earlier on about whether mirrors were an important part of you know, materials development, and absolutely yes, and we saw that for the James Webb Space Telescope. But if you're going to try and capture and manipulate and maybe even image gravitational waves, it'd be really good if you could actually have a mirror for them. And this paper does some really rather, rather nice physics. Uh, there's a lot of quantum involved, uh, but some rather nice physics, which says, yes, if you had a superconducting material under the right conditions in a vacuum, it could act as a mirror for gravitational waves. And the same physics that, you know, superconductor, you might have heard of the, of the uh, uh, effect, Meissner effect, where the, you, can, you can levitate a magnet. Well, so a superconductor doesn't just essentially exclude electromagnetic radiation, but it should in a similar way interact with gravitational waves. Now, take, take note, gravitational waves, not gravity. You can't, you can't suspend easily, you know, just a, a regular object, but it, it should be able to reflect gravitational waves. And so then a few years later, another graduate student came along and was actually trying to develop some of the devices that would rely on this principle. And the reason I put this, this is the title page of his thesis on the right hand side. And the committee in charge was a whole group of physicists, but you'll notice they had a material scientist in there because the student, uh, Al Castelli here, Alessandro Castelli, was having to build his detectors and his devices out of stuff. And it was really critical as to using the right stuff there as well. So material science, absolutely uh, important to gravitational research. So I had to get that in there to, to fulfill a promise that I would talk about that today. Um, now, my slide is not changing. Let's try that, there we go. So this is the second to last slide, uh, gravitational and space research, some examples of relevant material search at UC Merced. Now, if one of my colleagues on the campus looks at this list online and discovers that their work is not referenced on here, uh, I'm not claiming that this is an exhaustive complete list of everything, but it is a set of examples of the sort of materials research that we do on campus that can be related to uh, gravitational space research. Now, the gravity wave detection, I just gave that a little bit of a highlight in the, um, in the previous slide, that's coming out of the physics department. So, and that's down at kind of the quantum level. Now we'll skip, right at the bottom of my list here is a mechanical engineering. So that's mechanical engineering, that's kind of, you know, that's sort of the big end of things, right? Um, and the Mars Perseverance rover, some components were developed in collaboration with colleagues in, in uh, uh, mechanical engineering here at UC Merced. So NASA worked with the mechanical engineers, Professor Martini's group uh, in particular, and some of their, the consequences of their research is in action on Mars in the rover, you know, right now. In between these length scales, material science and engineering. Okay, and so we have to be able to talk to the people who look at the really small stuff, you know, the quantum stuff, and we have to be able to talk to people who work with the really big stuff, you know, the actual machines and devices. And so uh, we've got uh, colleagues uh, working on photovoltaics. Now, Professor Kurtz, who is one of our faculty um, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering, she uh, developed the um, photovoltaic cells that NASA has used because uh, the, the high efficiency cells. Um, Professor Nowodnik is working on materials that would revolutionize the output from these sorts of cells. Uh, energy storage and energy manipulation. So Professor Liu working on um, various capacitors and batteries and uh, fuel cell materials that could be used in energy storage and conversion. Uh, flexible wearable electronics, the idea that you would have detectors that could um, uh, measure the physiology and, and health monitoring. So Professor, um, Professor Wang, for example. And I'll include her in the her and Professor Liu in the biosensors for health monitoring and diagnosis bullet here. And materials for quantum computing. You're going to need computers to handle all these huge data sets and process huge, faster, a larger amount of information faster and faster. And so materials for quantum computing. Again, Professor Nowodnik is working on uh, materials like that. So just a few examples. Okay. Last slide. Um, and, you know, one can, one can indulge in fantasy, right? It's, it's okay to dream. So here we have um, James Webb, output from it. And 
I am now trying to get my head around things like gravitational lensing and trying to understand more about dark matter. And so, you know, dark matter matters, all right? Okay. Does it? Of course it matters. It seems to affect the results. We, you know, it's there. We know nothing about it except that it has an effect on other things. So the subject of dark matter. But it sort of sounds like material science, doesn't it, too? Because if there's stuff out there, well, it's got properties and maybe we can harness it and maybe we can do things with it. And some, somewhere in the future, there's going to be a material scientist, I'm pretty sure, who's going to have to come to grips with this. There's literally a lot of real stuff, stuff, matter, material, out there that we don't understand yet. And I'm sure that material science is going to be in the front line of trying to figure it out. So there is more or less on time and uh, 48 slides. I would welcome any questions that you have. Thank you. So maybe I should unshare my screen at this point. So that means I can get a sense of who we have. See if I recognize anybody. I do have a question, more, more like a comment, actually. So you, you mentioned before this book by the Edo Late that I have, by the way, marked to buy it in the coming weeks, because I find it very, very useful, right, about materials used in aerospace, in particular in the space research. There is this thing that, that I see repeatedly in the space community, that when you design a space instrument or, or any other sort of, of a space device, uh, technology or whatever, there is a lot of oral tradition going on in there, right? Like this person worked with that material and this person is working in the team in charge of building that mirror or whatever. And they suddenly come up with this weird material that nobody ever thought about. But my feeling is that that is not, um, that is not well organized, right? There is a clear lack of some sort of repository or book or manual on how to use different material mm -hmm. for different purposes in a space. Let me give you an example. When you're working on the space instrumentation, you are use semiconductors, right, to 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 read, uh, sorry, to to measure the incoming flux of photons from different for different many different types of instruments, mm -hmm. and UV photons tend to go inside the instrument, and they are extremely hard to reflect because their wavelength is very small which means that you cannot um, uh, reflect them with, with a standard mirror. So it is extremely complicated to design a proper uh, UV sensor, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is more a comment for you. Do you think that who can who can actually write this kind of materials, right? Because this is something that a lot of people know at NASA um, from working at very different instruments, but James Webb has been around for 30 years since mm -hmm. it was first conceptualized. So there is not, there is not, all of that is oral tradition. How can we actually solve that? How can we um, build a database that everyone can use more easily for de developing all those instruments, right? You, you, you make a very good point. Um, let me, and, and several, several aspects of which I, I, I could reply to, let me, let, and I'm trying to make a list as I go here. First of all, I, good to know you want to buy the book. Now you may find that your universe, I, I, I got the book, I didn't buy it, I downloaded it. Because <laughs> uh, my, my library, uh, as you see, said, subscribes to a digital database from which I was able to download it. So you may want to look into your universities. Yeah, that's uh, good to know. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it was free. Uh, so te technically I can't send it to you because I think what they, you know, the, the, they like to count how many people are actually interested in the book. So getting it directly from them, I think, is, is the appropriate way to do that. Um, now, in terms of oral tradition, so so yes, what we because it takes a long time to develop. So probably what you what you're seeing now is science that was known maybe ten years or more ago, but being applied in a in, in a particular context. So. The, the really cutting edge work is probably being done by the scientists, not by the engineers at this point. And I make the careful distinction between you know, material science and engineering has got its has got a leg in each part of the engineers, you know, not it's perfect, but it's good enough. The scientist is, I can make this better, and just the quest for 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 kind of improving knowledge. So 
in some sense, in any sort of applied situation, the engineers are not going to be right. So, so you've got to read both the science and the engineer. But the people who are doing the really cool stuff, on the other hand, too, they're also very busy people. They're, just, they're very busy doing cool stuff. And they don't have time to write it down <laughs> because they're, they're doing more cool stuff. So I think finding a way to, and maybe, maybe the, you know, people ought to be encouraged or find the time maybe as they move towards retirement. There ought to be some perhaps incentive that they document what they do. Or, or, um, but I agree, it's a, it, it is a problem. Or maybe it's, maybe it's up to the younger generation to these days with video cameras and recorders to actually talk to the people who've retired from a position. You know, and maybe there are constraints on what people can talk about because some of what they do is proprietary. So... Uh, I, I, it's 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 all of the above. It's time, it's um, disclosure agreements, and it is hey, it works. Let's just do it and, and not bother about you know the, <laughs> some some other little details. Of the, all of them. Um, Anna, I'm I'm going to say some sort of an addendum to that discussion. Um, NASA actually has a materials and processes technology information system that's available to everybody um, as long as you sign up for it um, and they will approve you to use that database so that you can track all the materials that have gone to space or have been in the International Space Station and stuff like that. So if anyone is interested, you can sign up for it and a NASA administrator will have to approve it. And a little bit of a comment because material science and engineering is really close to my heart and I really love what I do, is that that's the great thing about materials is that um, you don't just get to do engineering, but you also get to do a lot of science and integrate that into your engineering. So thank you so much for, for this talk. Um, again, I love material science. I'm very passionate about it. Oh, thank, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for that resource. If you could send me some details about that resource. I mean, I, I found in the process of pulling this talk together, first of all, I've made some slides that are not going to be just used for this presentation, but I, you know, I've updated some of my slides. And so probably two thirds of the slides for this talk are new slides that I didn't used to have before. Uh, and it's, I'm, I'm interested to see that Kiana's uh, here because Kiana and I are going to be teaching a course in the fall. And writing today's talk and slides and finding some of the actually huge range of resources online already that I found from NASA has given me some ideas about what we might be able to, to use. And so the, it's a freshman seminar style uh, uh, course, which is going to be about the materials and technology. But they're such compelling examples. And NASA has, it's, it's, it's really great in terms of the amount of educational material that I found already. Now, would they, do you think, uh, if I signed up for this database, would it be me who uses the database or would a class be able be allowed to use that database? It would have to be one person. Have to be one person. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. well, so it would have to, be, have to be Kiana and I sitting in front of a class and they tell us what they want to know and we drive the thing. Yeah, so it's, okay. uh, it's, it's looking like you're gonna share your screen and you're gonna you know, project the database in front of everybody. Um, in, I think you can make individual accounts so you and Kiana can have individual accounts for MapDIS. Okay, that would be, that, that, that's useful. You see, this, this, this is why I enjoy my job teaching, because every time I try and teach something or communicate something, I learn something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know more than I did this morning when I got out of bed, you know. So this is, of course, at my age, I start forgetting them as well more quickly, so it's a bit of a race, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is mental turnover at least <laughs> uh, okay well uh, thank you for the kind comments i'm seeing in the chat i appreciate it and I, I i appreciate every one of you who came to the talk because if if only one comes to the talk i would be happy to give the talk and in fact actually this, <laughs> in, in this case i learned so much in preparing the talk if nobody if nobody showed up it still wouldn't have been a waste of my time because i learned something <laughs> uh, um, anyway, so uh, if there's you know, one, one thing I, I, I offer, if there's an interest in a follow up, you know, maybe maybe people can't don't have time now or can't think of questions. But if Anna um, and Alvaro, if your organization wanted to 
organize you know a month from now a sort of follow-up just of questions and answers i wouldn't give more slides but if people are just sort of thinking of burning questions or just want to have a little little chat about it i'd be happy to come online again i, I i'm an old guy with terrible eyesight and lousy typing skills so i'm not very good at typing things back and forth but you know having a chat uh you know glad to Okay, Aaron has a question. What are the advances in biomaterials used for studies in space? Um, so, gosh, how long do we have? Uh, <laughs> um, I, th I think the, the idea of being, if we would say biomaterials, but the, the ability to, ahead of time, you want, you want to monitor your astronaut and probably do a really good test on, you know, are they likely to get sick between now and six months it's going to take them to travel to Mars? So, so the, the biomonitoring is going to be important before and during the, um, during the, uh, um, uh, the mission. Um, and I think any, you know, any sort of uh, prosthesis or any sort of, uh, uh, if, 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 you're going, if you're going to produce something for, for protecting for eyewear or somebody needs a, you know, maybe it's a corneal transplant and you know, what sort of material do you put in that maybe degrades a little bit less quickly under, under sort of space conditions. Um, I, 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 think, I think it's a very open, it's a very open um, end. So um, I'm also looking at biomaterials because, and the reason I'm not answering this very sort of focused is because biomaterials, I would have to ask for a clarification. Do you mean something that you implant or something that I learn from nature? And I'm writing a review on biomaterials from the biomedical side, actually. <laughs> it's my other summer big, big thing is to, to, to um, time, time consumer is, is writing uh, uh, that review. And um, what I'm having to distinguish is a lot of people, when they say a biomaterial, it is uh, an implant. It is something that's going to be in contact with bodily fluid. Or it could be a biological material from which we learn a lesson or from which we make something. And, no, there are two groups of people and they insist that they're right in their interpretation of this word. So I, I, I should probably ask for clarification here. Um, uh, I suppose, you know, I, can, I could imagine a machine that may, maybe the astronaut has to be put into some sort of state of sort of partial sleep or something, in which case maybe you've got an external machine filtering and processing and putting nutrients into their blood. Well, every aspect of that machine is going to be a biomaterial because it's in contact with human tissue, i.e. blood. So <laughs> maybe, maybe there's an area that one could focus on. So we have any more questions? I think I have, we have one more question and then um, we could cap it there um, uh, in the chat. Do I have an idea what kind of materials go into an implant, like a bullet brain implant? Um, okay, um, so I, I, again, I'm going to ask for clarification and I'm sorry to be, <laughs> Anna, you know me, right? I never answer questions straight out if I can <laughs> try to get really specific. So. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by a brain implant. Do you mean something that would be to shunt pressure, maybe a fluid accumulation, or are we trying to put a, are we trying to put a, a an electronic chip into a brain, or uh, what do you mean by brain implant? Perhaps a social media, perhaps you can like a chip. Um, so whatever it is, it has to have a surface that does not cause an immune reaction. And I think that is probably the most, um, and I, I, I thank, um, and his name is Buddy Ratner, his name really is Buddy, Buddy Ratner, who is a professor of uh, bioengineering at the University of Washington. So I thank him for my way of thinking here. And what he, uh, years ago, when I was a very young faculty member at the University of Washington in bioengineering, actually, as it happened. So uh, uh, quick, quick aside here, little tangent, but material science for me, my degree is in materials and metallurgy, Anna. Uh, <laughs> um, but I have, with that degree, I have been able, I, I, I got tenure in a bioengineering department 
in the USA, but was a material, material background. Before I came here, so after, after University of Washington, I went back to the UK, worked in Oxford, worked in Her Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, and I worked in a chemistry department. I was head of a chemistry department in Edinburgh at Harriet Watt University. So materials actually gave me enough latitude to function in these other areas. So my graduate students have variously been in material science, in bioengineering, in chemistry. Now, there are still bits of chemistry that I don't understand. I'm hopeless with organic chemistry. You know, it's a, it's, it's a really difficult subject. I can't, I'm no good at it. But material science prepared me for, you know, it's, it's a very broad discipline. It prepared me for the ability to function in these linked disciplines. So Buddy Ratner at the University of Washington, let's come back to, back to Earth, where we were. Um, he, his, his recurring message was that the bulk properties of a material are, are not so important when they are implanted it's all of what goes on at the surface that is important because the, the surface is where that contact is between the physiological environment and the material environment. So uh, the surface scientists kind of have a, have a field day here. And so the, con the constraints would be that the material is not attacked and destroyed by the, um, by the physiological environment, unless you want it to be. I mean, maybe the implant Maybe, I mean, this won't work for a chip, but maybe you want a short term implant that does its job and then uh, you know, dissolves, goes away. In which case you absolutely want it to be biocompatible. And so something made out of silk, which is where my review article is going, the one that I was talking about. So something made out of silk would be uh, very useful. But you also don't want it to trigger an, Im uh, an immune response that causes inflammation or rejection or, you know, worse still, just sort of poisons the cells around it and kills things off. So you need it to be uh, it's, it's sort of in between, basically completely neutral. If it stimulates a response, then maybe it stimulates a response which is that cells will stick to it, but that the right kinds of cells will stick to it and interface with it. But that's a very specialized kind of response. So if you're trying to put a chip in and you want that chip to somehow grow neural connections to the brain, that's a very specific uh, surface interaction problem. You want the right cells to arrive, the right cells to, 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 to continue to grow and proliferate and to make the right sort of connections. So engineering that surface to be biocompatible in the right sort of ways where they, it's, it's, where, it's, it's where everything really happens. What goes on inside the chip, whether it's a computer processor or whether it's something that, uh, you know, some, somebody else can deliver the, the imperious curse through and make, you know, Harry Potter analogy here, uh, what goes on inside the chip, you know, immaterial compared to how it interfaces with the environment. Um, um, uh, so Shmita, if you send me, um, if you send me an email um, and let me put my email address here into the chat, is, does the chat get put on YouTube or just the, um, Anna? I, I don't think it, I don't think it is transfer. But we'll okay. keep an eye on it in any case. I'll just put my email into the chat because remember I said I, I don't really send a lot of emails. I'm <laughs> typing. Uh, but if you, oh, that's uh, oops, wrong person. Um, you see my see my typing skills here. I, I'm, I'm sending this to somebody who's not even lined up anymore. Um, I should be able to, everyone in meeting, there we go, try that. Okay, so send me an email reminding me of your question here because I will send you a copy of that review when it's, uh, when it's been accepted. And, then, and then, then, if you, then if you, at the very least, if you can't sleep, I will have sent you the ideal cure. So. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for um, coming to this talk and thank you, Christopher, for giving an excellent and inform um, informative talk uh, to everyone. Well, you're welcome. Thank everyone you so much have for, a good day. Thank you for the opportunity. Stay safe, folks. Good luck. Thanks, everyone.